floor is yours. All right. Thanks, Lexi. So good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Donald Schwader from Iowa State University. I also happen to be spokesperson for the EPIC collaboration, which is seeking to build the uh, first detector at the uh, EIC. Um, before I get going today, can I just see a show of hands? How many people sort of have a more theoretical bent? How many people are more experimental and people who haven't decided? <laughs> okay, okay, good. So um, what I wanna do is, so I was, I was asked to talk about particle detectors and EPIC. And that, that, that sort of allowed me an enormous amount of freedom to decide what I wanted to talk about. So I'm gonna break this up into uh, sort of two pieces where in the first lecture today, what I'm gonna do is give you an overview of particle physics detectors, sort of starting from the ground up, the very basics of uh, interaction of particles with matter, different types of detectors and how they work. And we're gonna build that up so that we can then uh, on Friday's lecture, talk about the design of the EPIC detector at the EIC. Um, you'll see that one of the things that I truly enjoy um, is an overconstrained problem. And the design of a collider detector is a highly overconstrained problem by things that you might not expect, right? There's what you want to do, which is to measure the properties of the particles that are produced in the collision. And there's the technology and the physics uh, behind the detectors that you use to do that. And then there's all of the constraints that come in when you try to combine these technologies to make multiple measurements um, and measurements that actually support each other so all of the detector systems work in concert. So what I wanna do during these series of lectures is geek out a little bit, um, show you why I find all of this extremely fascinating um, and sort of take this opportunity because we are right now in the middle of designing and going from a conceptual design of the EPIC detector to a technical design. And we're facing all of these challenges. And so I wanna give you a flavor of what these challenges are so that you know, the next time you look at you know, a plot of some measurement from an experiment, you have an appreciation of the decades and thousands of person hours that actually went into producing the hardware um, that's required to make those measurements. Um, by the way, um, feel free to stop me at, at any time during the lecture if something I said sounds crazy or you don't understand. I'm more than happy to get through less material and have you understand the material we've gone through um, than just speed along through things. So feel free to stop me. Also, if you have any questions after the lecture um, that we don't get to, you, you can email me or, or I can uh, um, uh, pick them up at the beginning of, uh, of Friday's lecture. Okay, so let's get going here. So before I get started, I wanna make a comment on units for those of you who may not be familiar with this. And the important thing to remember is that particle physics are inherently lazy people. Um, they don't like doing the same thing over and over if they don't have to. And so typically what they will do is they will drop fundamental constants, like for example, here's my pointer. Ah, well, <laughs> technology, all right. So they will drop, for example, units like C squared, which show up everywhere. And in particular, when you do that, um, you can talk about energy and mass units interchangeably. And the fundamental unit we'll use to do that is called the electron volt. The electron volt is called the electron volt because not surprisingly, it's the amount of energy and electron, uh, the charge of an electron gains in falling through a potential drop of one volt, right? And so an electron volt is equal to 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Um, also, um, a lot of times we'll drop h-bar um, for simplicity, so h-bar will be equal to one. And so if you actually go to calculate anything with some of these formulas, what you have to do is sort of liberally sprinkle h-bars and c's around until the units work out right, okay? Now, I know this sounds crazy, right? Because ever since you've been an undergraduate, right, you were told by your professors, always pay attention to the units, right? But in fact, this works very well because you'll find that there's really no way to get it wrong. If the dimensional units of your equation are wrong, you won't be able to make it work by putting the h-bars and c's back in. And finally, um, when I say MeV, right, which I'll, I'll say a lot during the lecture today, I am talking about 10 to the sixth uh, electron volts uh, and not milli electron volts, which is 10 to the minus three. And I had to add that after I, I created an enormous amount of confusion amongst a number of students by not specifying that, uh, just to get started. Okay, so now that we know the units we're gonna be using, 
Um, let's start talking about modern particle physics detectors. This is just one example. It's the CMS detector in Cutaway. Um, and the basic idea behind a modern particle physics detector is we are going to collide something, maybe proton on proton, proton on antiproton, in the case of the EIC, electron on proton or electron on ion. That is going to produce a bunch of particles in the final state. And what we want to do is we want to measure as many of the properties of those particles as we can. We want to know their momentum. We want to know their energy. We may want to know what type of particle they are. In order to do that, we need to build a combined layered system of detectors that gives us all of this information. And we typically do this from the inside out by layering particle physics detectors so that we start with things like tracking chambers, which, was, which as we'll see, are a non-destructive measurement, meaning that the particle passes through them and leaves information behind all the way to things like calorimeters, which are destructive measurements, which destroy the particle's origin, create a shower of particles, and measure the total energy. Um, <laughs> finally, there are penetrating particles like muons, which go all the way through the detector systems, leaving minimal amounts of energy. And so we detect them by their lack of interaction uh, with most of our detectors. And then there are things like neutrinos, which don't interact at all, and we have to infer their existence uh, based off of energy momentum balance. So in a typical particle physics detector, what you find is sort of this onion structure of different detectors, all of which have, yeah. Tracking chamber, then if it's not, uh, you know, destructive, then uh, what is its purpose? It's just for the path only? I'll, I'll get to that, right, exactly. What you're trying to do is measure the path of the particle, right? So you wanna measure the momentum of the particle, right? So you collect um, um, uh, points along the particle's trajectory to measure its bend. Right. If you were to destroy it, you could measure its energy, but you might not. You might not know anything about its momentum. You might want to know both. For example, in the case of measuring an electron, so, but then you'll not be able to identify the particles, right? Because if, if you look, okay, correct, right. That, that's the reason you do tracking and then do calorimetry. Yep. So um, you have this layered uh, 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 collection of detectors and subsystems, which are designed to all work together, enhancing each other's capabilities, and in many cases, compensating for their flaws, okay? So, in order to get started, we need to talk about how you detect particles. And to do that, I'm gonna go all the way back to the beginning, and we're gonna talk about how particles interact with matter, okay? Now, let's start with a simple situation. Let's say I have a very heavy particle. And by heavy, I'm thinking of, let's say a proton or an alpha particle, heavier than an electron, right? And we're going to send that electron into, let's say a low density uh, material. Think gas, for example. A gas is made up of a dilute concentration of atoms. Atoms themselves are relatively dilute. They're mostly empty space. They are electrons with a nuclear core. So to first order, when we send, let's say a proton, uh, through a gas, uh, what we're interacting with are the electrons in that gas. And if you think about it conceptually, what we're doing is we're sending a bowling ball into a sea of ping pong balls, right? So what this bowling ball is gonna do is it's gonna barrel through and knock all of these ping pong balls out of the way. It will be donating some of its energy to those ping pong balls. And therefore by losing energy, it is interacting with the material and we can measure that energy loss. Um, you've probably done the problem uh, in uh, undergraduate mechanics where the, you're asked, let's say, between a collision of a heavy object and a light object using momentum and energy conservation, what is the maximum kinetic energy transfer between the two? So think of a bowling ball barreling into a ping pong ball, right? What's the configuration for maximum kinetic energy transfer between the bowling ball and the ping pong ball? What does a ping pong ball do? when that energy transfer is maximum. It, it reverses its momentum, right? right? We, we sort of learned that in basic mechanics. So the maximum uh, kinetic energy loss is just the kinetic energy of the particle times this ratio, four times the mass of the electron, divided by the mass of the particle that's knocking it out of the way. Um, so if we just take an example of a 5 MeV alpha particle, I chose an alpha particle because it has a mass of... Uh, of uh, four nucleons, and that allows me to cancel the four in the nuclear and the numerator and denominator. And see, I told you particle physicists are lazy, right? But when I do that, what I find for a 5 MeV alpha particle, uh, the energy loss in a single scattering with an electron 
is the maximum energy loss is about 2.6 keV, so 2.6 kilo electron volts. So down by a factor of a thousand compared to the total energy of the alpha particle. So we already know several useful things about uh, a heavy particle passing through, let's say a dilute matter. A typical particle will undergo thousands of collisions before it loses all of its energy, right? And so when we think of energy loss, um, the energy loss passing through a dilute material will be relatively small. And if we can collect that ionization, we can have a relatively small impact on the trajectory of the particle while still measuring its, um, its motion. The heavy particle will be deflected only by a small amount in the collision, right, with the material. Again, uh, uh, you have a bowling ball barreling through ping pong balls, right? Sorry. Yeah. I'm pretty sure I formula before. Is the formula the same for relativistic uh, collisions? No. No, this is just a classical estimate, okay. right? Just a classical estimate, right? Okay. The only thing I wanted to do here is just set the scale. Okay, uh, so, and the Coulomb force has an infinite range, right? So a particle that is going through a dilute gas is actually interacting electromagnetically with everything in the gas, multiple particles at the same time. So rather than thinking about this as a discrete series of scatters, we can actually think of this as a continuous energy loss along its path because it's having multiple interactions that it's averaging over as it's passing through the material. Now, I won't say much about this, but the energy required to ionize atoms is a few tens of electron volts, right? And so you saw that we can, in principle, liberate up to KeV type energies. Uh, what will happen is you will have very many soft electrons that will get liberated. Some of them will scatter an electron very hard, and that electron will become another particle passing through the gas and losing energy. Uh, these can show up uh, in, in uh, tracking, and they're known as delta rays. So if you ever hear the term delta ray, that's just a hard knocked out electron um, from the primary particle passing through the material. All right, so we have continuous energy loss along the path of the particle. Uh, this can be described what's called the uh, described by what is called the beta block equation. Uh, it was uh, uh, originally due to Hans Beta in the 1930s, and then there were a number of corrections to it, also by Hans Beta. Um, it's, a, it, it's a beautiful exercise in physics for the time, because realize in the 1930s, there were two things that were sort of fundamentally new, right, that people were still struggling with. There was quantum mechanics, and there was special relativity, right? And in order to get this right, uh, Hans Beta actually had to include both of these in his calculation. He had to include quantum mechanics because the, uh, the uh, ionization energies had specific values um, for the different materials that the particle could be passing through. Um, and what we shows up in this formula is an ionization energy I, which is the average over all ionization energy processes uh, for a particular material. So for air, this is about 86 electron volts. You're averaging over all of the ionization energies of all of the electrons for the, for the nitrogen and the oxygen. Yeah. temperature? I'm sorry? Beta is inverse. Beta is not inverse temperature. Beta is the uh, relativistic beta. So it's the velocity divided by the speed of light. Mm -hmm. um, so the, this ionization potential shows up here um, for different values of material. If you want to guess what it is, again, experimental physicists love these rules of thumb thing. If you want to guess what it is, the ionization energy divided by the Z of a material is averages around 10, 10 electron volts. Okay. So what also shows up in here, not surprisingly, is the electron density, right? Uh, it's also proportional to the charge squared of the particle traveling through the material. Now, if we examine this in a little bit more detail, uh, what we find is that the energy loss depends quadratically on the velocity. That's this beta squared term that shows up. It depends quadratically on the charge of the particle. So the energy loss grows like the charge of the particle squared, and it doesn't depend on its mass, right? That might seem surprising at first, but think this is an electromagnetic interaction, right? So nothing about that interaction cares about the mass of the particle that's barreling through the material. Now, for very low energies, uh, beta much, much less than one, this term becomes negligible. And so the energy loss goes as one over the velocity squared, right? And so for low energies, 
you have this steadily decreasing uh, uh, energy loss as you go to higher and higher velocity. Okay? Um, this plot here, if you'll notice, shows you the energy loss per unit distance, right? And it shows you in the highly intuitive units of MeV grams minus one centimeter squared. All right. What's typically done in these kinds of plots is to divide the energy loss by the density of the material. The density of the material roughly goes with the electron density. And so by dividing, I can put all of these curves for different materials on the same plot. Okay. But don't be confused and be careful. Um, if you go to calculate an energy loss, a lot of times the equations work out where you have to divide by the density to get MeV per centimeter. Okay. Now, as we said, this energy loss drops, decreases as a function of one over the velocity squared, and reaches a minimum for something like three times the uh, mass of the particle. So you can see, for example, for the proton momentum scale along the bottom of this axis, the minimum point of this curve happens for a momenta of about 3 GeV, right? How many people have heard the term minimum ionizing particle? That's what a minimum ionizing particle is. It's a particle that sits at the bottom, the minimum of the beta block equation, right? A minimum ionizing particle is a convenient handle, a convenient benchmark for talking about the energy loss of a particle, right? Or the behavior of a detector. How does it respond to a MIP, okay? So you'll see that quite frequently. Now, for beta uh, growing larger and beta approaching one, the energy loss rises logarithmically due to this term. And without reading the slide, can anybody tell me why that happens? What happens to the electric field of a relativistically accelerated particle, right? It's contracted. It gets contracted, right? And so, right, it contracts along the length. And what you end up with is the field lines, therefore, tend to collapse and become much more dense in the transverse plane, transverse to the motion. The density of field lines tells us what? The strength of the electric field, right? And so the, at the, the transverse dimensions, the electric field grows stronger um, as you uh, get mm -hmm. higher and higher momenta, and that contributes to this relativistic rise, right? Now you can see this is a logarithmic scale. It doesn't, it doesn't go up dramatically, right? But there is definitely a rise in the energy loss, okay? So that's what people refer to when they talk about the relativistic rise in energy loss. Um, I went backwards, I tried to go forwards. All right, I just included this in the slides here. Again, it's the same plot now, shown as a function of the momentum of the particle in mass units, or the muon momentum, pion momentum, and proton momentum, again, for different materials, uh, all the way from lead up to helium liquid. Um, and um, just for reference, uh, this includes things like the electron density, the ionization potential, um, and the density of the material. Yeah. Uh, um, in the EIC, are we, are we regarding the ions, uh, proton or okay. ions as uh, relativistic particles or classical particles? So the, they're, they're going to be highly relativistic. So certainly the beam ions will be highly relativistic. If you have ion fragments, right, those will probably also be highly relativistic, right? So, so, so the typical energies we're talking about at the EIC, the detector, let's say in the central rapidity region, uh, needs to be able to measure particles from a couple hundred MeV all the way up to many GeV, right? At a couple hundred MeV, right, for a proton, let's say, that's not highly relativistic, but all the way up into the highly, highly relativistic regime. So in the best uh, law formula, we don't need to consider the case where uh, beta is much, much less than C, right? We, we... Well, you do, right? So, for example, um, if you have a couple, well, let's just take a look at an example here. So, if you look at, let's say, pions, right? So, pions, um, uh, we need to be able to detect pions down to, let's say, a couple hundred of MeV. A couple hundred MeV is in this region here, right? And so, you're sitting mostly in the minimal ionizing, right? So, most of those low momentum particles are going to be at the bottom of that minimum ionizing curve. Um, if you start getting up to a GeV, 10 GeV, you're sitting further out on the relativistic rise. And in, depending upon where you are in the kinematic region of the IC detector, you may be looking at a couple hundred MeV pions, you may be looking at 50 GeV pions. Okay? 
Does that help? So we need to cover a wide dynamic range, right? In terms of the kinds of things uh, that we're measuring. Okay, now that's a heavy particle, right? But not all particles are heavy particles. Um, there's also electrons. And so how do electrons interact with material? Now we don't have bowling ball on ping pong ball. We're firing a ping pong ball through a sea of ping pong balls, right? So that's a little bit different. Um, and in fact, there's another process that opens up. Not only um, can electrons lose energy due to collisional losses in very much the same way, although the formula is different, and this is also due to beta, but uh, when we expose, let's say, an electron to the large electric field of a nucleus, um, that electron will be bent, its trajectory will be deflected, and that means there's an acceleration, and whenever you accelerate a moving charge, what happens? It radiates, right? Bremsstrahlung radiation, breaking radiation. And so you can have energy loss due to Bremsstrahlung radiation as well. So in addition to collisional losses with electrons, we also have Bremsstrahlung energy losses. And if you sort of take those two, take the ratio of those two equations and make some approximations to make it boil down, uh, what you find is that the ratio of Bremsstrahlung energy loss to collisional energy loss goes roughly like the kinetic energy of the electron. Uh, and then there's this factor of, of the C divided by 1600 here. That means that Bremsstrahlung radiation will become more important at higher energies, right? It will also become more important in denser material, larger Z. So if we look at this ratio of Bremsstrahlung, uh, uh, the ratio of, of uh, this is the ratio, but if we look at the collisional energy loss in air, aluminum, and lead, and then we look at the Bremsstrahlung energy loss due to radiation, for example, at 10, T, 10 MeV kinetic energy, an electron will have roughly equal losses due to collisional energy losses and Bremsstrahlung, and anything above 10 MeV is gonna be dominated by Bremsstrahlung, right? Yeah. We want to minimize the Bremsstrahlung and, and increase the collisional? We don't actually have a choice, right? The, the, what, what will happen depends on the kinetic energy of the particle, right? And in fact, we're going to take advantage of that, right? Because the fact that electrons uh, basically shatter into many, many particles um, creates a parton shower when we interact with heavy material. And that's the basic principle behind things like electromagnetic calorimetry. So, so we, don't, we don't have a control over it other than the amount of material we put in front of it. Um, and so we adjust that to take advantage of different properties. And we'll talk about that. Other questions? Okay. All right. Oops. Uh, now, um, we can pr parameterize uh, Bremsstrahlung energy loss uh, in terms of an equation uh, which is proportional to E. Okay. And because it's proportional to E and it's dE dx, that means the rest of this stuff has units of a length or inverse length. And so we can rewrite this equation as E over X naught, where we just combine all of these constants together. And that equation is a simple differential equation, right? And that simple differential equation just means that the energy loss, right, will be exponential in this constant, X zero. That X zero is referred to as the radiation length, right? A radiation length is the distance after which, on average, an electron will electron's energy will have been degraded by one over e. Okay, so that is a very convenient unit of measure, and you'll hear the term radiation length used a lot. Radiation length is used a lot to describe how much material you're putting in front of a particle, typically. Okay, so it's typically measured in radiation lengths. As an example, for lead, uh, a radiation length is about five millimeters. Okay? All right, now we've talked about heavy particles. We've talked about um, uh, electrons. Uh, we have to talk about photons, right? How do photons interact with material? Well, there are three relevant processes for the interaction of photons with matter. There's the photoelectric effect, Compton scattering, and pair production. In the photoelectric effect, what happens is of course the photon comes in and is absorbed by an atomic electron. That atomic electron is ejected, right? So in fact, the photon converts itself and its kinetic energy into an electron. Now, um, this is difficult to calculate, but the, but the probabilities are easily, easily measured. It's most important for low energy photons 
because for low energy photons, the cross section is highest to be absorbed by the atomic electrons, which have relatively small binding energies. There's also Compton scattering, which is a scattering of a photon off of an atomic electron. Similar process, but here the photon donates only a portion of its energy to release the electron. And so now you, you multiply into two particles. You have the remnants of the scattered photon and you have the electron coming up. And finally, you have pair production. Pair production is the conversion of a photon into an E plus E minus pair in the field of a heavy nucleus. You have to have the heavy nucleus here for momentum conservation, but in fact, the nucleus is so much heavier that it doesn't recoil by very much. It doesn't take away much of the energy from the process. So roughly speaking, um, pair production has a threshold at twice the mass of the electron. That's what you need. You need to create two, two electron masses. Okay. So above twice the mass of the electron, the pair production process can become important, and it becomes more important as you go to higher and higher energies. Now, in the same way you define a radiation length, you can define an interaction length or a pair production length, and it's related to the uh, uh, radiation length by about nine sevenths. Right? So typically, for all intents and purposes, when we talk about the interactions of electrons or photons with material, and we want to characterize that, we typically just talk about it in terms of, an, of, a, uh, of a radiation length. Right? And for all intents and purposes, a photon interacting with material kind of uh, it, it correlates well with an electron interacting with a material because the photon is going to donate its energy depending upon the energy range to electrons, the electrons might radiate and create more photons and you can sort of see where this is going. So at a given energy, all three processes continue, can contribute, but only one will dominate. And an interacting photon or an electron rapidly leads to a shower of particles um, in the material. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about electromagnetic calorimetry. So in order to talk about um, the relative probabilities of these different processes, uh, let's just consider a simple thought experiment where you have a beam of photons incident on a slab of material of thickness T, right? And you have a detector behind it, which detects the photons that are in the beam. And let's just make the assumption that if a photon interacts in the material, it scatters, it goes off at a different angle, and I don't measure it. So by counting the number, by knowing how many photons there are in the beam, counting the number of photons that hit my detector, I know how many photons have interacted and been removed from the beam, right? Now, we can define a probability per unit length to remove a photon from the beam, and, we, and the photon is removed if anything happens. So we talk about that in terms of a linear attenuation coefficient mu, which is the probability per unit length to interact by the photoelectric effect, the probability per unit length to interact by Compton scattering, and the probability per unit length to interact by pair production, right? The probability per unit length is related to the intensity, and lo and behold, we get another, another differential equation with an exponential solution, right? See, I told you particle physics are lazy. Physicists are lazy. We like exponential equations, right? That We've got that differential equation down, okay? So we can take a look at the different probabilities by just looking at the relative probabilities for these different coefficients. And this is just some example here. When you break down the total linear attenuation coefficient, this example is for aluminum as a function, now again, on a log scale of the uh, kinetic energy or of the energy of the photon. Um, and what you see is that at low energies, you're dominated by the photoelectric effect. So below an MeV, tenth of an MeV, 100 keV or so, the photon cross-section is dominated by the photoelectric effect. Compton scattering comes in and begins to fall off for higher energies, and pair production picks up at about twice the mass of the electron and rapidly above 10 MeV or so begins to dominate the cross-section, okay? If you take a look at lead, um, lead is interesting because in the photoelectric effect, you can actually see step functions in the cross section. Those step functions are related to the point at which the photon has enough energy to begin to elect, eject electrons from the innermost shell of the lead nucleus, so the K shell and the L shell. Once it has enough energy, a new channel, new more phase space opens for the cross section, and you see a jump in the cross section. But again, you see that above 10 MeV or so, the interaction is almost entirely by pair production, right? So 
there's a scale, right? Above 10 MeV, it's almost all pair production. Below 10 MeV, you have a mixture of uh, Compton and pair production. Below a few hundred KeV, it's all photoelectric. <laughs> okay, any questions over any of this? Okay. All right, so let's start to talk about how we actually put this into use. That's the basics of how particles interact with matter. Yep. Yeah. How it interacts with matter. Ah, I left you a question at the end of the uh, slides to think about to think about how how you how you would measure neutrons. That's actually a really good a really good question, right? Um, I don't want to spoil that question for you guys to put. Uh, let's do this. Uh, that, that's one of your questions for the recitation section tonight. Think about how, if you have to measure neutrons, uh, you might measure it. And in doing so, think about the different energy ranges of neutrons and how they might interact, right? Good question. I deliberately left it out to give you guys a hard time. All right. <laughs> so. Um, let's talk about how we might make use of this now in order to detect the passage of a particle. We now understand how a particle uh, uh, loses energy passing through matter. Clearly, collecting that energy is a signal of the particle's passage. And so we want to collect that energy and turn it into meaningful information. Uh, the simplest possible way to do that, uh, imagine that we have some sort of a gas-filled volume, right? So we have a gas-filled volume. We want to collect the ionization. To collect the ionization, we need an electric field. So simply put, I have sort of a capacitor, right? I put an electric field across this gas-filled volume. That's a capacitor, right? Um, I can take a simple example. If the ionization potential of air is about 86 electron volts, if I deposit one MeV of energy into this gas-filled volume, um, that's about 1.2 times 10 to the fourth electrons. I also get a similar number of, of uh, positively charged ions. Let me ignore those for the moment. Um, and I can say, what kind of voltage change will that introduce on the capacitor? Q equals CV, right? So what I need to know is the capacitance of my capacitor. Let's assume that we have a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by one centimeter gap. The capacitance is epsilon naught A over D. That gives us about 100 picofarads. And when I convert this, this gives me about 19 microvolts. That's an incredibly small signal, right? That's very small. So right away, you see that just collecting the ionization actually gives you a small signal. That's potentially a problem, right? However, it does work. And I just wanted to show you one example. Uh, this is how smoke detectors work, right? Smoke detectors actually use an americium source, which decays producing alpha particles. Alpha particles, they have relatively low energy and they're highly ionizing because of their charge. And so it allows those alpha particles to uh, penetrate into uh, an ionization chamber and it collects the ionization as a constant electrical signal across the plates in the ionization chamber. If there's a fire, fires produce smoke. Smoke particles are large. And if that gets into the ionization chamber, it will block the alpha particles, reducing the signal and therefore triggering a smoke detector alert. Right? It's the basics of how smoke detectors work. But from the simple application here, you can right away see that this has a lot of problems for how we want to operate, right? Small signals. And in fact, you also have very long times to collect these signals because the time to collect the signal is determined by the drift velocity in the gas. Drift velocities in the gas are actually relatively small. Right? We think, well, wait a minute, this is ionization electrons. They may have KeV of energy. You know, They should be close to maybe beta 0.5. Why is the drift velocity only a meter per second? Can you tell me why the drift velocity is so slow? It's, it's also the reason that we have Ohm's law. All over the place. Bingo, right? So when you think of this ionization drifting, it's not just drifting along happily. It's interacting with the rest of the stuff. And the interaction time is extremely short. So what happens is the electron travels a very small distance before its distance gets randomized again. And then it's under the influence of the electric field, randomized again, under the influence. When you do that, it averages out to a very, very slow drift velocity. Okay? So what this means that crossing a one centimeter gap is gonna take about 10 milliseconds, 
right? And let's say if I'm trying to detect a particle this way, I can detect one particle every 10 milliseconds. Otherwise, they show up on top of each other. That's no good, right? That's slow. So I need something that is faster, and I need something that gives me larger signals. Yeah. Uh, what about the what about the direction? Means because of the random because of the random motions, the, the direction of the electron will also change, right? Yes. Okay. Right. So the, so so again, this is sort of what you think about when you think about like a current flowing in a wire, how you get a drift velocity in a wire. Um, the, the electrons are moving along under the influence of the electric field, but every time they scatter off an atomic nucleus, they, 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 their directions are randomized, and then it starts to drift under the electric field again, right? If there wasn't that, the electron would continually accelerate, right? And so you wouldn't have Ohm's law, for example. Okay. okay. So um, ionization chambers are used for things like radiation monitors, smoke detectors, et cetera, but they're not really appropriate um, to what we want to do, which is to detect the passage of a particle um, with a single pulse. So um, let's take a look at a different design. This is something called a proportional counter. So now, instead of making a parallel plate capacitor, let me make a capacitor which has a cylindrical geometry. So I'm going to have an anode wire in the center, and I'm going to surround it by a cylinder which provides my cathode, right? When I do that, the electric field goes like one over R, right? Sort of the standard electrostatic problem. And that means that as I get very close to the wire, I'm gonna have a very, very large electric field. The larger the electric field, the more accelerated the electrons are. If I can accelerate them enough, they'll knock other electrons out of the gas. So what you end up is what's called an avalanche region near the wire. If you have ionization that's created in the chamber, it will drift to the avalanche region. And in the avalanche region, it will then amplify itself, right? And so it looks something like this. Again, drawing these as discrete, you have, let's say, a packet of ionization reaches the uh, avalanche region. Boom, it creates a whole bunch more electrons, right? So I've managed to amplify the ionization signal and get a larger charge. I can also collect that charge a little bit faster right? Because things move very quickly in this avalanche region. I can put a higher electric field on things and get a larger drift velocity. So that's good. This is all moving in the right direction. Um, I just included this formula here because the multiplication or gain that you get in a single uh, proportional counter, you can parameterize in terms of the applied voltage, the properties of the gas, the pressure of the gas. But what you also have to include is the fact that when you amplify this pulse, what you're asking for, let's say from the electronics that are maintaining the voltage, if you're asking for a rapid donation of energy to the system, and that means that the voltage can sag, right? So you can see that there can be a rate limitation with this kind of a detector. If you have too much charge going too quickly, the voltage sags, your collection efficiency changes, the property of your detector changes. Something to keep in mind. All right, now what happens? You say, great, that's fantastic. I've got a big signal. Let me just keep cranking the voltage up, right? I can get the signal as big as I want. At some point, you will reach the region where every time you have ionization crossing the detector, you get an avalanche, which is a spark between the anode and the cathode. This is called the Geiger region. And in the Geiger region, you lose information about the pulse. If you're operating in a region which is referred to as the proportional counting region, you amplify the pulse, but it's proportional. So let's say I amplify the pulse by a factor of 10 to the sixth. If I have twice as much original energy deposition, I still maintain knowledge of how much energy was deposited by the ionization. I just amplified it in a proportional way. When you go into the Geiger region, all you know is that you had an ionizing event in the counter, right? So a Geiger counter is literally just a counter. Once you get a hit in the, in the counter, it amplifies and that's it. You just get a click, right? Neat device, not useful for us. One thing that's interesting, however, is you have to use a special gas in any of these regions because if you think about the amplification process, uh, once I have an avalanche, how do I turn it off? Right, I have more and more electrons getting created, cascading down to lower and lower energies, which are hitting more and more atoms. How do I shut that process off? What that? So, so don't. How about inert gas? Yes, 
Yeah, exactly. So you usually use special gas mixes. Um, one called P10 is 90% argon and 10% ethane. The argon is the primary ionization gas. That's what you want to ionize. The ethane is there because ethane has a neat property that the excited uh, uh, atoms uh, in the argon will emit photons in the ultraviolet and the ethane will soak them up. It'll absorb them without re-radiating, absorb them into rotational and vibrational states. And so what happens is the ethane tends to shut off the cascade. So you have to have something there to shut off the cascade. That's a common thing that you'll see in gas detectors. You ever say, ah, you know, 90% this and it's some small fraction of that. You wonder why that hydrocarbon in there, that's why. Now, having said that, there's some really fascinating uh, electrochemistry that happens uh, in these detectors when you do this. Um, usually chemists, so you can, they, they will study a mix of argon and ethane and they can tell you everything about it, right? But nobody studies a mixture of argon and ethane when it's exposed to ionizing radiation. And so all sorts of interesting electrochemistry can happen. And there's a whole industry of understanding how these gases actually work when they're exposed to ionizing radiation. Yeah. I just want to comment on the medium region where you say it's not used. I understand the first one is because of recombination, uh, because the ion uh, charge pair, because of the low voltage. So Yeah, th this one here, right? You get no amplification. Right, right? but now the other one there. The yeah, so what happens in this region? In this region, it's proportional, right? But this line is linear, right? So that's really easy, right? Because if my voltage changes a little bit, I'm not really changing the behavior of the detector. Here, the slope is changing very rapidly, right? So if there's a small change in the voltage of my detector, the proportionality constant changes dramatically. So it's much, much harder to operate a counter in this region uh, because it's nonlinear, right? The amplification is nonlinear. Does that make sense? You could use a Geiger region, but then you don't know anything about the ionization left by the particle, right? So for example, you might want to know the amount of ionization because you want to know something about the charge of the particle that passed through it. And you've lost that information. There are things, uh, uh, there were things called streamer chambers, um, which used to be used in the 50s, right? 50s and early 60s, right? Which actually... Um, created um, streamers, visible discharges um, uh, in passing through tracking chambers, and they would take a picture of the discharges and then analyze the picture. Why did that stop? Why did that stop? Yeah. Horribly inefficient, right? Horribly inefficient, right? Imagine the amount of time that it takes to um, for a human being to analyze a picture like that. There was no machine learning in the 1950s. Well, but nowadays, but nowadays we, we have ways of making the information digital right from the start. Okay. And that's, yeah. that's what I'll get to, right? So, so we bypass that by just going digital right away. Right? Um, okay, so um, now this leads us to, we now understand how to create a detector which has the kind of properties we want, right? It can create a, a, a large signal, right? And that large signal can be measured by our electronics. Now imagine I take it away from one single tube and I create a gas volume which has a whole bunch of wires in it, right? Um, I can have multiple wires. I can have anode wires along with cathode wires and wires at different potentials to shape the electric field. That's called a multi-wire proportional chamber. I now have a gas volume that is sensitive to the passage of charged particles by collecting the ionization on the anode wires as the particle passes through. I can even get trickier, right? If I put not just, a, if I collect not just the charge on the anode wire, but I have an external time reference and I collect the time that it takes for the uh, uh, ionization to hit the anode, I can actually interpolate between these wires and get a very accurate measure of the position. That's, that's what you call a drift chamber, which is a particular type of multi-wire proportional chamber. So now you see how we can build up this energy loss in gases make measurements in multiple different types of, of detectors. Now, this, this expands exponentially from here, right? Because um, there are many ideas and the design of these chambers gets very complicated. This is just the original multi-wire proportional chamber uh, by Sharpak in 1968, and he got the Nobel Prize for it in 1992. Um, and this is what the electric field configuration looks like for the anode wires, right? And so you can see the field configuration funnels the charge 
into the anode wires and amplifies it near the wire. The problem with this simple kind of a detector is that the, uh, the ions have to drift to the cathode, right? And so that determines your charge collection time and determines the speed of your detector. So you would like to be able to collect the cathode ions quickly too, but they're ions, they're big and heavy and slow. So you'd want them to go a short distance. So there are other things like uh, microstrip gas chambers where instead of drifting back to the cathode plane, you actually have an insulating substrate and you have the anodes and the cathodes on the same strip. And notice what happens. The electrons come in here, the, uh, the, uh, um, the ions don't need to go as far. And now I can play with the geometry, right? I can play with the geometry and have a cathode plane with insulated strips. That's a micro gap chamber. And now you can see that the path is very short. So there's all sorts of engineering to make these detectors collect a signal more efficiently while at the same time being faster, right? Um, there's also something called a gem. I'm not gonna say a whole lot about these, but I did wanna introduce them because you will hear it. A gem is a different way of amplifying the ionization signal, right? What do I need? I need a concentrated region of electric field to create an avalanche. A gem does that by taking basically a thin metallized mylar foil, so there's metal on both sides, and laser drilling or etching of holes through that film, right? That creates a small hole with a very specific electric field so that when ionization drifts to that thin layer, it gets amplified uh, in passing through these holes. So that's a gas electron multiplier. And in fact, I can have layers of gems to amplify over and over and over and get significant amplification. Yeah. Size with the this is about 30 microns, 30 microns. Technology wise, what do you have to do? I have to produce large areas, areas of highly uniform, repeatable, right? Um, uh, uh, holes in these films, right? It's technology difficult. Um, finally, I did want to say something about a time projection chamber. I can't, I can't come to Stony Brook and not do that. Um, but this is the S Phoenix time projection chamber, uh, which is just being commissioned at Brookhaven. And a time projection chamber is sort of the ultimate realization of uh, tracking in a gaseous detector, right? Imagine I now take a volume, uh, of, uh, and in this case, it's a cylindrical volume, and I put an electric field in that volume. And any ionization in that volume I now drift, I allow it to drift along the electric field to the ends. And at the ends, I have some sort of multi-wire proportional chamber, which amplifies the signal, right? Now I have a nice low mass tracker and I get and I, as many points along the track as I want. I can get as fine a precision as I want, okay? Now, TPCs have difficulties because uh, one of the problems with TPCs is you have to have a very uniform electric field. That uniform electric field can be spoiled if there's too much charge built up in the gas volume, space charge, it distorts. That means the drift, the electrons drift not in straight lines, all of a sudden your tracks are messed up, right? The biggest problem for that are the ions that are created in the avalanche which wanna drift back into your detection volume. So what's typically done with older style TPCs was to have a gating grid, right? You get an avalanche, you take a gating grid that stops the ions from drifting back into the chamber. But when that happens, I'm not sensitive to any other collisions. So that's a rate limitation. One of the special things that the S Phoenix TPC has done is actually use gems instead of multi-wire proportional chambers, same as the Elise design in a configuration that limits ion backflow and allows it to operate continuously, right? So that's turning an inherently slow detector into now a streaming detector that can operate continuously. All right, now, you don't have to just drift in gas, right? You can actually uh, use a solid material um, as, a, uh, as a, uh, a medium to collect ionization. And that's the basic idea behind a silicon detector. In a silicon detector, a traditional silicon detector, uh, what you have is basically just a diode, right? <laughs> Forget a lot of the details. What you have is basically a diode, right? You reverse bias the diode so that you deplete the silicon. And now I have nothing but electrons and holes all filling the volume. When a charged particle passes through, it liberates electron and hole pairs. They drift in the silicon and I can create a signal across the diode that I can amplify, okay? Modern silicon detectors, of course, are much, much more complicated using 
modern uh, lithographic techniques to create very complicated arrays. I've just shown you one example here. This is the ELISA Alpide structure for their ITS2 inner tracker. You can see that it's got the sensitive region here um, and then the uh, diodes that actually collect the charge. One of the neat things about modern silicon detectors is the old style hybrid sensors actually have to bond the electronics to the sensor, right? That creates a lot of extra material. And I'll talk about material can be a real problem. Um, what the new sensors do is because these things are built using modern lithographic techniques, the same way electronics are built, right? You can just build the electronics right on top of the sensor. The advantages that you have with silicon detectors is they can be fast. They can have um, uh, they can uh, have very high precision, right? When you talk about lithographic techniques, pixels of order ten microns, fifteen that's not hard. So you can have very high precision space points. Okay. All right. Now all of this that we've been doing, we're doing because we want to be able to track the passage of charged particles. So let me say just a few words about tracking and some of the limitations with tracking. Um, if we put the particle in a magnetic field, and in most cases uh, of colliders, few exceptions, um, that field is solenoidal, right? So you have a solenoidal magnetic field, the particle comes out and curls in the magnetic field. Um, so you measure its position at multiple points along the track, and we know that a particle in a magnetic field, its momentum is going to be related to the radius of curvature. So what we do is we can take that track of that particle from the measured points, uh, we can fit it to a circle, right? Assuming the field is uniform. Um, and from that, we can extract the radius of curvature. Uh, so that's very simplistically uh, how you measure the momentum of a particle in a tracking chamber like this. You bend it, you use the bend radius to measure the momentum. The resolution that you have on the momentum is uh, proportional to this thing called the sagitta. And so if you think of a particle bending in an arc, if you were to draw a straight line between the beginning and the end of the arc and look at the difference between the arc and the straight line, that's called the sagitta, okay? So what you're really measuring is the sagitta and your ability to measure the sagitta directly determines your momentum resolution, but wait, there's more, right? Particles passing through material is not free. Certainly it liberates electrons, but the more material you have, there's also the probability for essentially Rutherford scattering off of the nuclei in the material. That will deflect the passage of the particle, and it will deflect it by what's known as multiple scattering. And multiple scattering is a parameterized in terms of the radiation length. More radiation lengths of material, the more multiple scattering is a problem. So you'll typically hear people will talk about, oh, that's a, that's a low mass detector. That's only 5% of a radiation, right? The reason for that is I want to measure the track's position without interfering with that arc. Multiple scattering comes in as a contribution to the uncertainty in your momentum. Um, if you just have the measurement uncertainty on the sagitta, it's proportional to the measurement uncertainty on the sagitta. And you can, there are models for this. You say, well, fine, I want to just measure it with a certain accuracy. So I just introduce more and more and more measurement planes. And it goes like roughly like this, like the square root of number, the number of measurement planes. So you say, fine, I'll put in a thousand measurement planes. Ah, now you've put a significant amount of material in the particles way. And when you do that, you activate a second term to the overall momentum resolution, which is due to multiple scattering. If it's measurements alone, what you need is a good magnetic field and a long lever arm for the particle. But if you put too many detectors in the way, you become limited by the material that you've put in place and by multiple scattering. So this is always a delicate balance between these two, between these two things. All right, I am going very long, so let me keep going here. Now, there is another type of detector uh, known as a scintillation counter. How many people have heard of scintillation counters? People mess with them, right? Um, basically, an organic scintillator is a piece of plastic. Yeah. Uh, I have a question. So uh, now you talk about the E field, magnetic field that uh, when the particles or inside the uh, detectors, let's say, gas uh, detectors, so there are electric fields. So where, where do you apply the B field on? Inside the 
It so in, in, for example, let's say a time projection chamber, right? Um, inside a time projection chamber, what you do is you arrange the electric field so that it's parallel to the magnetic field, right? So the ionization will drift along the electric field and because, right, the velocity is parallel to the magnetic field, it won't be affected by the magnetic field. Um, the electric fields that are in these uh, chambers that the particle is actually passing through, the deflection from those fields is usually negligible, right? Because uh, the particles are traveling through a relative, let's say a GeV or more, um, and the, the volume in which they encounter that electric field is relatively small. So it's typically the material, right, that the detector is made of that's the problem, and not, let's say, the, the fields that are used to collect the ionization. Does that help? That's a good question. Okay, um, now organic simulators are a different way of measuring the uh, passage of a charged particle. They make use of the fact that, of course, the material ionizes. What we're going to do now is not collect the ionization. We're going to turn it into light, and we're going to collect the light. And the way that works is a typical simulator, and usually these are plastic or oil, are doped with, with a fluorescent chemical. And what happens is a passage of ionizing radiation excites the molecules in the material uh, and sets them into uh, motion, right? And so it excites them into from an electronic ground state uh, into an ele electronic excited state. And these molecules have uh, an enormous number of vibrational levels, right? So the vibrational energy spacings are about a tenth of an electron volt and the, the spacing between the excited states are an electron volt or so. The lifetime of the vibrational levels is much, much smaller than the lifetime for the decay from the overall electronic excited state. So the molecule rapidly cascades down into the ground of the excited state, the ground vibrational state, and then decays uh, by emitting a photon, usually very close to the ground state um, of, in the material. Now we've got photons and you say, well, wait a minute, aren't those photons gonna get reabsorbed by the material? And in fact, scintillators are mostly transparent to their own radiation because the correct energy level transition here to absorb it there are many, many molecular vibration levels, right? So there's an enormous number of phase space and only one channel to reabsorb that photon. And so for the most part, um, they are transparent to their own uh, radiation. The doping elements shift what is typically UV light to visible light, I've seen scintillators before they glow green, right? Typically that's because of the dopant, which absorbs the UP light and transfers it to uh, visible light. These are typically read out with photomultipliers, People messed with photomultipliers before. Photomultipliers have been the workhorse of nuclear and particle physics for 40, 50 years, right? Um, they're a clever little device which has a photocathode, and that photocathode is just a uh, glass or quartz covered with a low work function metal. So the photon comes in, gets absorbed, knocks out an electron. You then have a series of focusing dynodes that create an electron avalanche that amplifies the signal. So you can get a measurable signal right, out of a single electron, right? You can get gains of anywhere from 10 to the sixth or 10 to the seventh. The problem with this is that uh, the uh, phototube is of course very sensitive to magnetic fields. And we said we wanna put things in a magnetic field to measure their momentum, right? Um, you can imagine that this carefully arranged dynode structure gets messed up. If you put it in a magnetic field, you lose gain and it doesn't behave the way you want it to. There are many alternatives to silicon photomultipliers. One of those is a, called a SIPM or an SIPM. It's a silicon photomultiplier device. Again, um, based off of simple silicon, what they do is have a set of cells uh, that basically create an avalanche every time a photon hits those cells. That avalanche puts out a fixed amount of current. The current produced by the silicon photomultiplier is proportional to the number of photons. Terrific, and nothing is sensitive to a magnetic field. Um, there are difficulties with this because if I make the cells very, very small so that I can get a lot of them, my efficiency goes down because I have to have an edge around the cells that's not sensitive. If I make them very large, I can lose photons because if two photons hit the same cell, I'll only register one of them, right? So an SIPM has to be very carefully matched to the use. SIPMs are also highly susceptible to radiation damage, and that's something I'll talk about, uh, talk about tomorrow. All right, um, calorimeters, right? We're now looking at sort of the end where we wanna make a destructive measurement of the particles. Uh, in a calorimeter, 
um, we basically initiate a shower of particles in the high density material of the calorimeter. And that shower has a natural size and a natural length. In an electromagnetic calorimeter where you're measuring photons or electrons and positrons, that natural length is a radiation length. And we've already said for lead, that's actually about half a millimeter. So electromagnetic calorimeters tend to be very small, very compact. Hadronic calorimeters um, measure, uh, create a shower based off of the hadronic interactions with the atomic nuclei in the absorber. That's a smaller cross section. Therefore, the relevant length scale tends to be longer. Um, and therefore, um, you're looking in lead now at about a 10 centimeter interaction length. So if you look at calorimeters for hadrons, they tend to be great, big, huge, bulky things, right? There are two types of calorimeters, loosely speaking. There are sampling detectors, which allow the particle to interact in the absorber and then sample the energy in the shower. And then there are homogeneous detectors, which are types of crystals, where the crystal actually scintillates when uh, charged particles go through it. And so the crystal is both the absorber and the sensitive medium. All right, um, just, a quick, uh, just a quick comment about things like an electromagnetic cascade. Um, we have seen where electromagnetic interactions of particles just tend to create more electromagnetic particles, right? And you already get the idea that, wow, if I have a particle coming in and interacting, I can get a whole bunch out of the end. So it's imagined, for example, uh, we have a high energy incident photon or electron uh, where we're dominated uh, by either pair production or by Bremsstrahlung, right? And so for simplicity, let's just assume that the pair production length and the radiation length are the same. And on average, um, if I have a thick absorber, uh, I, every layer of thickness X zero, I will on the average create two particles out of every one particle. So after so many interaction lengths, after T layers, I will have two to the T particles. And the average energy of that particle will be E0 over 2T. This will continue until the average energy of particle falls below the pair production or the Bremsstrahlung threshold and other processes start to take over. So from, uh, from a parameterization of that energy, which is about 7.3 MeV per lead, you can calculate the uh, thickness in radiation lengths at which the shower will be a maximum and the total number of particles. Just as an example, if you have a 50 GeV electron on lead, you will generate about 14,000 particles in this electromagnetic shower, and the peak will come at a max of about 13 radiation lengths. It's a little bit of an over -interact, overestimate, but you'll typically see for electromagnetic calorimeters interaction lengths that are of order uh, 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 15 to 20, calorimeters that are of order 15 to 20 interaction lengths. This is an example of a sampling electromagnetic calorimeter that's used for S Phoenix. It's scintillating fibers. So now plastic scintillator, but drawn out into one millimeter thin fibers embedded in a epoxy and tungsten matrix. So the absorber and the scintillator are embedded together. Um, it's a sampling calorimeter with a sampling fraction of about 2.3%. So the measured energy, you sample the energy and you have to correct by the sampling fraction. Um, another example of an electromagnetic calorimeter, this is a liquid argon calorimeter at the LHC, just to show you that you can do calorimeters in different ways. The absorber um, are uh, clad uh, lead, steel clad lead absorber sheets in an accordion. The reason for the accordion is it doesn't offer any opportunities for the shower to channel down any gaps in the detector. The active medium is liquid argon, and instead of collecting scintillation light, you collect the ionization in the liquid argon um, using a PC board that's uh, bonded to the absorbers. Okay, I'm gonna take just a couple more seconds and finish up uh, calorimeters here and then we'll stop, is that okay? All right, um, these are some examples of uh, uh, homogeneous electromagnetic calorimeters. This is a lead tungstate crystal, right? And you think, wow, let me make uh, something out of lead and tungsten and let me make a pure crystal, right? Would you expect that that would be optically transparent? No, but it is. Right, It's optically transparent and it scintillates. And so a lead tungstate crystal is one of those that has both the uh, uh, absorber and the active material the same. This is an example of a CMS crystal from the central barrel, about 23 centimeters long or 25 radiation lengths. Lead and tungsten are dense, right? So I can make a very nice compact crystal. It naturally generates light and I can read that out with a photon detector. 
Just as another example, I wanted to show you sort of the other end of the spectrum. This is the Borexino detector, which was designed to measure uh, uh, neutrinos, uh, solar neutrinos. Um, and their active element is 300 tons of basically mineral oil uh, doped with a scintillating agent. Right? And so neutrinos interact in the volume of the detector. They knock out electrons, the electrons range out, um, and the energy is collected by scintillation light um, and then viewed by photomultipliers tubes surrounding the uh, detector. It's a homogeneous calorimeter. Um, a brief word about energy resolution in calorimeter. Um, energy resolution in calorimeters has three terms. There's a stochastic term. It goes like one over the square root of E. So you can see that that is just a measurement of the number of processes you sample over. If you have higher energy, you create more particles in the shower, you sample over more particles, you have less statistical fluctuations when you average. Um, and so this term um, is just driven by fluctuations uh, in the shower generation process. There is a noise term, which is either due to electronics, pile up from other collisions, things you didn't do right, and you can work hard to limit that term. There's a constant term that shows up here. And notice it doesn't scale by E. This is due to imperfections in calorimeter construction, non-uniform response, things you don't understand in the calibrations. And that is what people really work hard to limit because um, that, as you get out to the highest energy uh, measurements, limits your energy resolution, right? And so when we talk about electromagnetic calorimeters at the EIC, we're going to talk about um, uh, trying to limit that constant term. Um, very briefly, hadronic calorimetry. Uh, hadronic calorimeter generates a particle cascade by interactions with the nuclei and the absorber material. This cascade will have an electromagnetic and a hadronic component. And so, for example, a hadron comes in here, interacts with a nucleus, it may create a neutral pion. That neutral pion decays to two photons. Now I've got an electromagnetic shower. So some of the energy will go into an electromagnetic shower. Some will go into either ionizing particle, charged pions, for example. That's a problem because typically, yeah, they're just nucleon. Yep. So um, now I've got a problem because a typical hadronic calorimeter will not have the same response to an electromagnetic shower as it has to a hadronic shower. It will sample them differently. If I have fluctuations in the amount that goes into these two, that fundamentally limits my energy resolution, right? When you hear that it's not compensating or E over H is not equal to one, that's what calorimetry people are referring to. There are ways to get around this. Um, things like dream calorimetry, which try to measure the shower in two different ways and then combine that information. They also tend to be very expensive because you're building twice the detector in one space. Right? The other thing you have to do is you have to calibrate for losses to nuclear binding energy. In an electromagnetic calorimeter, you sample the energy, divide by the sampling fraction, you pretty much got it. Right? In the case of a hydronic calorimeter, some of the energy is actually lost, the binding energy of the nucleus that you broke up. Right? And so that has to be very carefully calibrated. If you just take the energy from the sampling fraction, for example, this is an epistemic uh, simulation for EPIC by Derek uh, back there, uh, where you put in, let's say, a 20 GeV pion, and the energy distribution you get out is awful. When you combine it with the electromagnetic calorimeter and you calibrate, you start to see a response which is peaked right at that energy. Okay, um, as usual, I have talked way more than I planned. I have not yet covered um, particle ID detectors, things like Sherenkov counters, uh, but what I will do is I will combine that into, uh, I'll leave the slides in, but I'll combine that into the lecture for Friday. Um, sorry for going over, I appreciate your indulgence. Um, do uh, do calorimeters, uh, especially hadronic calorimeters, do they have a life expectancy to them? Because I would think after years and years of it, like uh, getting this destructive radiation flux, that they would um, that that damage material damage would accumulate. That, that that is a huge problem. For example, at the LHC, right? Especially calorimeters in the uh, very forward region where the particle flux is concentrated, so near the beam line, um, you you have radiation damage in your electronics which usually shows up first. If you have silicon photomultipliers, the radiation damage will show up there. You can radiation damage the scintillators if you're using scintillator readout. So radiation damage is a huge problem at the, e at the LHC. It's a concern at the EIC in very specific regions of the acceptance. And I'll show that tomorrow. But again, along the beam line, 
We worry, for example, that the SIPMs will die um, uh, and we may even have some damage to the elements in the calorimeter. So radiation damage is absolutely something you have to think about. Okay. Yep. Good question. Yeah. On slide 37, I think you were you were showing us the borax xeno. Oh yeah. Like what if I know it's a neutrino detector, mm -hmm. but what I'm if you had like a dark matter particle that was also neutral around one GeV mass? Would it also detect that thing? Oh, that's a good question, right? Um, well, okay. So keep it, keep in mind this is you know the the whole idea of this experiment is that neutrinos, so you don't want to detect anything else, right? So it's heavily shielded. Right. But you're saying, let's say I had a dark matter particle doesn't interact by anything else. Right. Maybe it interacts by some new interaction. Um, as long as it interacts um, in a way that liberates, let's say, electrons uh, in this scintillator, um, that would give you a signal. Right. Um, but that's not dark matter searches like that have already um, pushed the limits. Right. Right. Way down. I'm secretly trying to fi find out about the neutron. Ah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, right, but of course, this um, this kind of thing you would um, you would shield it with tons and tons of rock, right? right? Which the neutrons won't get through because they interact by a different interaction. What interaction? Strong interaction, yeah. right? So in that case, um, it wouldn't be neutrons. You do have problems with muons, which can be highly penetrating. Uh, and you have problems if you have uh, residual radioactive contamination in the materials of the detector. Right, so try to eliminate that at the part per billion level, right? So, yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to ask on the, uh, we defined the mu on the total linear attenuation coefficient mm -hmm. as um, having, um, as a sum of uh, the three uh, interaction processes in that term. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So once we have all those three uh, processes, do we regard that as uh, probability equal to one? Or yes. So that right. So, right. So if there is an interaction, right, it has to fit into one of those, one of those slots. So and each one of those is the probability of interaction per unit distance. Right. And the total probability is the sum of the individual probabilities. Okay. So as long as we have what is three processes. Exactly. Exactly. If you had more processes, you would add on more, more coefficients. But do they even exist? <laughs> What do you mean? Do they beyond the three processes? Because these are the only ones. Well, those would be beyond the standard model type, type processes, right? So that would be, or, or right? So that would be some new interaction, right? Which, by the way, we probably wouldn't find this way because we only defined it in terms of three and we just categorized them based off of that. Mm -hmm. If there was something there at the part in a million level, we'd probably lump it into, into one of the others and not realize it. Other questions? Yeah. Why did they use water on the outside? Why did they use water on the outside? Ah, so um, this was basically uh, for uh, vetoing muons, right? So they could measure the muon flux. through it. So they have PMTs that face in and look at the scintillator, and they have PMTs that look out and look at the water. And so the, um, uh, the, the, they would pick up muons um, based off of their interaction with the, uh, with the water. Um, and so they can subtract off the, the muon component to their background. Can you another thing? Like sure. Instead of sure. Can you give me an example? Uh, what can, can we use, use? What can be used instead of food? Yes. What can you use instead of water to detect muons? Ah, that's a good question, right? So muons, right? They're they're sort of the mass of a pion, and they interact electromagnetically. Right? Do they Brumstrom? <laughs> much. Not much. Why not much? Uh, they are um, they, so since they're so massive, their synchro their synchrotron radiation levels are very low. Exactly. So so in principle, yes. But the fact that the the new the the muon is so massive, the Bremstrom cross section goes like one over the mass. Right. So Bremstrom is not important for muons, pions, protons. It's there. It's it's, it, it's there. It's mathematically there, but it's just not important. So it's not going to it's not going to initiate an electromagnetic cascade. Right. Um, and it's going to punch through. Um, muons do have can interact with, let's say, an atomic nucleus, but that's a very low cross section process. Right. So muons are typically detected by putting a whole bunch of stuff in front of them. 
and then seeing what survives, right? Um, and so you can imagine, um, if you remember that CMS diagram, they have muon chambers on the outside, right? And so the basic idea is I put all my calorimeters and everything in the way, I see a track coming in, I see a minimum ionizing particle through the calorimeters, and then I have some tracking chambers and I see a track through that. What was that? Must be a muon, right? Good question. I'm taking up your, your snack time, your coffee break. Yeah. Page number seven. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For this graph, can you explain why do we have the same turning point for the for each of the substances? Well, you really so so the the, the trick is the scale here, right? Notice the muon momentum, uh, pi on momentum, and proton momentum scales are at are, are different, right? The one doesn't show up at the same point in all of these scales. By plotting it that way, you tend to put the minimum at the same point, even though the minimum typically shows up for three times the mass of the particle, right? These all have different masses. The muon and the pion are sort of close, but the proton isn't. But by changing the scales down here, I make all of these DX, DEDX curves look the same, right? So they're really not at the same point, right? So for the proton here, it's about three GeV. For the muon, it's about right, 300 MeV, 300 MeV. So they're not really at the same point. The plot just makes it look that way. All of those could be gamma. Yep. Beta gamma. Yep. They are the same for all of those parts at that point. It's not because the mass are the same. All right. Let's thank uh, What's next? We go outside. There's the sculpture, the Toros outside. And we'll be there, take a couple of photos, and then I'll come back for our break. Yeah, we'll, we'll take the stage.